Amen. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we just come into this place tonight in the precious name of your son, Jesus, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, just for another tremendous opportunity, Lord God, just to, Lord God, gather together, Lord God, with friends and family that you've just blessed us with, Lord God. We just thank you, Lord God, for, for, for this, Lord God. This is the body of Christ, Lord God. So we thank you for that. Lord God, even more important than that, Lord God, just the opportunity to come into your presence. Father, we thank you that you're here tonight. You're not here, Lord God, because of uh, the fact that we're in a, a, a place that's set apart, Lord God, for, for a spiritual or worship gathering, Lord God. You're here, Lord God, because the earth is yours and the fullness thereof, Lord God, that you're present here. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that this place and this time has been set apart, Lord God, to specifically recognize that, Lord God. So we do. We thank you, Lord God, that you desire, Lord God, to come and to have fellowship and communion with us, Lord God, through your precious Holy Spirit, Lord God, and through your word. So, Lord God, we are so grateful for that, Lord God. We are a very grateful people, Lord God. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we're in such a tremendous season, Lord God, a season of opportunity, uh, Lord God, that uh, the world finds himself, uh, Lord God, facing peril, Lord God, just as you have spoken through your, your word that in the last days perilous times will come. And Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, that We've been made, Lord God, we've been called to times such as this, Lord God, even as Esther was, Lord God, for your kingdom, Lord God. We've been called, Lord God, to be passionate, to be persistent, and be powerful, Lord God, during times of peril. So, Lord God, tonight, as we come into this place, Lord God, we've come to be equipped, Lord God. That's what we're here for, every single one of us, Lord God, to be equipped for the work of the ministry, Lord God. So we just ask you, Lord God, to equip us by your precious Holy Spirit, through the teaching of the word. Lord God, just make our hearts and minds, Lord God, just open, receptive to you, Lord God. If there be anything that would in any way impede us, Lord God, Father, any unconfessed sin, Lord God, any unforgiveness, whatever there may be, Lord God, that uh, present in our lives, Lord God, that would in any way obstruct, Lord God, your Holy Spirit moving in and through us, Lord God. We just lay those things down. We say, search us, Lord God. Know our hearts. Try us. Know our thoughts. See if there be any wicked way within us, Lord God. We want to do an inventory of us, Lord God. We want to examine ourselves to see whether or not we be in the faith, Lord God, because we want to be found faithful. So, Lord God, we just ask that you would just anoint this, this time in your word, Lord God. Just cause it to, 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 to go deep and, and mighty, Lord God, into us. Lord God, that we would be equipped, Lord God, to do great exploit for your kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Once again, good to have uh, our visitors that are here, uh, visiting from out of town during this Christmas time season. Always good to have... Uh, our other family, the body of Christ, from Daytona Beach and other places that have come into the city. Uh, tonight we're going to continue our study on the subject matter of understanding the anointing or being set apart for his service. Obviously using the life of David, King David is an example of our case study on this subject. So if you have your Bibles now, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. If we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 to the extent that we can tonight. We know how that is, though, don't we? Amen. <laughs> We try, though. I tell you what, it's not from a lack of effort that we don't do these things. I mean, we just don't get too much of a hurry when it comes to, to the Word of God. It's been a good time. If you're just tuning in with us tonight, uh, this is the Raven Ministries International Training Center, and we are doing that study on the understanding the anointing and really what it means to be set apart for His, ser uh, for his service. If you uh, want to get the previous, because this is uh, part eight, I guess it would be. If you want uh, the, the previous part, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is under my name, Troy Bond, B-O-H-N, and you can find actually uh, one, four, five, six, and seven on there. We're gonna have to reshoot two and three because the audio didn't work on that. But I'll, I'll get to that soon. Uh, and so, but you can find those other ones on there, and we'll put the, we'll fill in that gap for you uh, very soon. So if you want to get caught up and, and do that, every one of them are pretty standalone. You know, we get a lot each week that I think speaks for itself. So you don't feel like you have to play catch up. But anyway, good to be here tonight. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1 through 10. Verse 1 says this. It says, The Philistines now gathered, or they mustered their army for battle, and they camped between Silco and, and Judah. 
and Azekah at Ephraim's Domain. And so the, the Philistines that we talked about last week, they, they focused their attack upon the armies of Israel in three areas, which are really the three areas that Satan does uh, to the church every single day. So it's nothing new. You know, uh, the, the enemy, the, the good thing about the enemy is he's not real creative. He's not a creator. He's not very creative. What he does, he just plays the same thing over and over again. And, and I've talked about this uh, really ad nauseum to the fact that, you know, he'll always just bring the same thing up. The only thing that he has against to use against you is your past. And so if, if we can ever get the church focusing and fighting forward, we'll understand what victory is. Amen. Because I've counseled uh, people for 30 plus years, 30, 30 years of pastoral ministry, and years prior to that just as a believer and a minister in the church. And most of the problems people face are not issues or uh, things that they're facing in the future. Most, most people really don't even think about the future. They don't plan for the future. They certainly don't plan for eternity. Uh, I asked a question one time in the discipleship. I said, you know, how many, how many of you, and I'll ask the question here today. Some of you were, were present, but most of you were not in that class. I said, how many of you want to go to heaven? Amen. You want to go to heaven, right? Amen. You, you want to go there. How many of you got born again or got saved so that you can go to heaven? Amen. Did you do that? You want, to, you want to go to heaven? And so my, my next question was, and is tonight, so what are you going to be doing there? So you put all this effort, you've, you've given up, you've given up, quote unquote, this temporal life. You've given up the influence of this world. You've given up sin. Audrey, so that, you know, because you plan on being in heaven for how long? Is this going to be this kind of thing that you, you know, take a, you know, extended internship in, in glory for a few hundred years. You plan on being there for... For eternity. Mm -hmm. And so, what are you going to be doing there in a thousand years or so? And most people kind of have that same response. If I'd ask anyone, most people would, I, I, well, I, oh, you, you would probably fumble around looking for some type of answer. Isn't it interesting, you know, that we do what we do, we preach the gospel so people yes. can get to heaven, and then they say, well, what am I going to be doing? And people are silent. Come on. And so I, I believe that's a problem in the church is that you really don't have you don't have a plan because you don't know what you're going to go do when you're going to get there. Yeah. It's kind of like, well, hey, hey, man, we're really planning. And in June, we're going to go on vacation. Well, where are you going? Well, I have no idea where we're going. So are you going to go someplace warm? Or are you going to go someplace cold? Well, I don't know. So how are you going to pack? Well, just hope for the best. <laughs> well, are you hoping for the best for eternity? See, God's got plans for us. And those plans don't just extend to the point where your heart stops beating. Yeah. Those plans stretch into eternity. Yeah. And so if I see the value of something eternal, I see the, the value in something present. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm living my life in the present. But if you're always looking back and thinking, okay, I got saved because I felt bad about who I used to be. Or I got saved because... I was unhappy in a, in a previous situation, or I got saved because I was in a bad relationship or a bad situation, then all you're looking is the, the, the only value that your salvation has for you is what's behind. Come on. See, I want my salvation always to be forward face, facing. And I, I preached for years. And if I ever get around to finishing that book, I'm gonna you know, probably get some insight into this, you know, pressing towards the mark and forgetting those things that are behind. You know, I, I preached on that subject matter uh, for years and years and years, and one day somebody's going to get it. And they're going to they're they're going to realize that you know what? There's nothing behind you that you can do a thing about. And I said this that your 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 past only goes as far back as what. The last the last at least Pastor Alex listens listens to me <laughs> preach for 25 years. <laughs> Your past only goes as far back as the last application of his blood. Amen. And so if I keep the blood in my past, I don't have to look back and, and, and have myself defined by my past. I can always be defined by my promise. The promises of God are yes and they're amen. God is not slack concerning his promises. Yes. And some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish or any should be back in that chaotic place, but that all should come to Repentance, another way of thinking. And so if I'm forward thinking, if I'm thinking in, in, in advancing things, then I'm not always finding myself drug into the perils and the problems of my past. I'm moving forward. And so the, the, the Satan's always using those things. He's attacking them at that place. That's so cool. If you remember, that was the branch. That word literally in the Hebrew, it's the branch or where we're connected. So he always wants to, to, to put his attention where you're connected. Uh, you know, uh, I, was, I was watching a, a, a video the other day 
of a, a wrestling match, and this guy was challenging a guy that was, he, I think this guy was a three-time state champion, and it was, it was, it was folk-style wrestling, uh, amateur uh, high school wrestling, and he, he, he realized that the, the, the vulnerability that this guy was facing in this match was in his legs. He had had some type of issue that nobody really knew about, and he knew that the guy, the guy that he was, he, that was the champion, I mean, the guy was ripped. I mean, a big upper body, very strong guy. And, and in all intents and purposes, you couldn't tell that he had a, a physical deficiency, but this, this other young man caught wind of it. This other young man was, was no slouch. He, he definitely didn't have the wrestling pedigree that he did. Yeah. And so he started focusing on that place. He started getting him at his foundation. And he ended up upsetting this guy that had, I think the, the, the guy had won his last previous eight matches or so by pinfall. And so he, 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 he attacked him at his source or where he was connected to the ground and brought him down and ended up winning in a, in a thriller. And so the adversary understands that as well. He's going to target those places in our life that keep us connected. One of those places, obviously, the, the primary place is our connection to God, to that type of relationship. He wants to separate us. But the other thing is, he's to separate us from one another. Yes. And folks, he's slick. He's slick. Yes. I mean, he really is. I mean, he's, 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 he's very shrewd. He's very cunning in his ability. So whatever he can do, whatever he can use to separate people. You think about in, in this country right now. Uh, one of the first things that, you know, you got the state of California, New York, you know, you can go into a strip club, but you can't go to church. Yeah. Come on. That's exactly it. Well, why is that? Well, he needs to separate you from what's going to bring you strength right. and put you into something that's going to per create perversion right. into you. Right. And so what does Hebrews tell us? Not to do what? Not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, which is the custom of some people. Well, what people? Well, the people that ain't walking in victory, the people right. that are failing, the people that are always uh, being bombarded by the works of the adversary. Come on. He said, but what? The much more as you see that day approaching. Yes. That's what we should be gathering, yes. not less, but more. Because I tell yes. you what, if, if we're not going to gather together yes. because a, a pandemic hits the world that has claimed what point, I believe initially they said it was claiming 0.96% of those infected, and now it's gone down to like 0.6%, so less than a percentage of the people it, you, you could, could succumb to this, this virus, and so people aren't gathering because of that. Well, what's going to happen when they say, listen, you either did mine? <laughs> JC, what you this time? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. You never know. <laughs> I just jumped up and get back into work. I want y'all and them to be able to hear this. And so, what's going to happen? Here we are. We got people not gathering, not at their source, getting cut off because of what may get one half a percent of people that are infected by it. But folks, listen, if we are disconnected from our source, Christ Jesus, Come and by on. extension from one another, it's going gonna, it's gonna to claim a lot more than that. Yes. And so what's going to happen the day they tell you, listen, it's either you choose God or you choose the Antichrist. Otherwise, yes. we're going to separate you from your head. Come on. Because that's going to happen one day. Folks, it's already happening in other countries. Yes. There's people that are losing their lives every single day because they won't, they won't disavow themselves to Christianity and, 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 and convert to Islam or whatever the, the yes. religion is. So people, it's already happening to people. And so if in our nation, it's so easy to separate people from that gathering place by something that may claim one half a percent of people, what's going to happen when they put those type of stringent uh, uh, responsibilities upon folks with relationship to the gathering. Most people won't make it. No. Amen. They won't. You can't preach a faith message while you're walking in fear. Right. Amen. Period. I mean, the worst the worst case wow. scenario for me is that I get to go to be with Jesus before my 145 years of life expire. <laughs> Amen. Period. I mean, the worst case scenario. Hallelujah. And so I, it's, I'm kind of like Paul the Apostle. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In other words, 145 years should the Lord carry it. Just here to torment the devil and just right. make people realize that there is a God in heaven. That little old shrunk, shrinkled up little Troy Bond guy still out here preaching. Man, everybody he's ever known and been around, and they've all gone to be with Jesus, but he's still here just declaring the name of Jesus. Or I could go be with the Lord. Amen. Worst yeah. case scenario. So we're walking in fear based upon that. And people have said, listen, oh, the reason that you do that, the reason that you, you, you take all these precautions is, is to, to, to love your brother. You heard that one? 
Well, I'm uh -huh. preacher, if you're out there and you said that so you didn't have to gather and you can have church. Yeah, we have a, a church online. You know why? Not so we don't have to meet in perfect person, but, but because of those folks that can't meet in person, Amen. they can tune on and hear some word. Amen. We've done it long beforehand. We haven't missed a lick. We haven't changed a single thing about Amen. what we've done. Amen. Amen. We've done this before it started. We'll continue to do it after. We're we'll continuing to gather. Why? Because it's valuable. Amen. We've got Amen. to yes. come to that place of our soul. I need you. Hopefully yes. you need me, but I need you. Yes. I need your feedback. I need your prayer. I need your encouragement. Uh -huh. I need those yeah. type of things. Yeah. I'm not an island in and of myself that yeah. can just exist all by myself and me. Amen. I, I need you. We need one another. We are the body fitly joined together, yeah. each one supplying yeah. the needs of the other. I got a call the other day from uh, on my, my insurance company at the doctor's office that I'm under. And they said, listen, we're just, you know, we know that you haven't been in a while. We just need to get you in for a checkup. And I said, oh, really? I said, I have to get back with you. And I said, well, that's fine. You don't really have to worry too much. It's going to be a virtual checkup. <laughs> you can hold, the, hold my phone to my neck and take my blood pressure. What do you mean a virtual checkup? Well, I'll virtually have an appointment. Click. I said, I don't want that. I want to see a doctor. I want to see a real doctor. What are you going to do? Well, you know, a face, you're going to FaceTime a medical procedure? I mean, what's this coming to? Well, that's what happened. And so the branch, we've got to stay connected to that, whether it's in relationships, whether it's to God, the, the fellowship of, of the brethren. But he also they, 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 they targeted the asikah or the well, that place that you're being filled and you're being refreshed. Folks, you know what? I get refreshed. You know, repent ye therefore. Be confirmed. Think differently. Be converted from your previous way of thinking. Come on. That your sins can be blotted out. That oh, times yeah. of refreshing Woo. can come from the presence yes. of the Lord. Acts 3, 19. So I'm yes. going to get to that place where there's a constant conversion. Folks, listen. I wasn't just converted one time. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's the constant turning yes. over. It's the constant yes. conversion. It's the constantly yes. being refreshed in the Lord Jesus. It's a it's a filling and a, and a, and a continuing to be filled. I get filled up so I can pour out, so I can get filled back up, so I can pour back out. Amen. I just didn't get filled the day that I went to an altar and somebody laid hands on me and I and I shined an Iki Mohad. Amen. I'm going to continue to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm going to pour yes. out. Why? Because when I'm filled, out of my belly is going to flow rivers of living water. It's not a it's not a pond that lays stagnant. It, but it's a river that continues to flow outwardly f from me because once a river uh, river stops, what does it become? It becomes a lake. Yeah. Amen. So he didn't call us to, to go fishing on a lake. He calls us to be those streams of life and that well spring that's constantly yes. being poured out. But they also says that they, they also attacked at the Ephrus de Mem or the edge of the blood or that place where you're victorious. And so he'll attack the branch where we're connected. He'll attack the, the well where we're refreshed. And he'll, take, he'll attack the, the blood where we have our victory. So that's where the Philistine armies set up. And so the adversary, once I said, like I said, he's, he's very shrewd. He's very adapted. Practice of dividing and conquering. And so he'll separate you from, from your source in order to, uh, to divide you, to conquer you. Look at all the way back to the book of Genesis. Yes. Here we had Eve. I don't know how distant she was from Adam. But, but enough so where the adversary could come and tell her something without him saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. He already hooked her. Amen. He hooked her and he began to entice her. He drew her away from that place and began to make her some promises and put some doubt and some unbelief in her mind. That way she could do the exact same thing to her husband. Yes. And so that's what the enemy does. He can separate you so that he only has to combat one individual. Why? Because two is better than one. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Amen. Because if it's just you, he can isolate you. He can get you by yourself. He can tell you whatever he wants to tell you. He can tell you that nobody likes you. He can tell you that, 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 that nobody appreciates you. He can tell you that you're some dirty and rotten person. Come on. But if you have somebody sitting up saying, whoa, 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 listen, we've already been through that before. Come on, hasn't, they, hasn't God delivered you from that? Doesn't yeah, God on. got a bigger plan for you? You can't go back into that same thing and expect some different results. That's insanity. Come on. And so this is accomplished most of the time through some sort of compromise or sin. That's how he separates and divides people. What's Isaiah 59 2 say? What? It's your sin that sets you apart or cuts you off from God. And because of your sins, it says he has turned away and won't listen anymore. Won't listen. And so it's because of somebody else's sins that God don't listen? No, because of yours. Come on. And so if you've got a struggle, it's not, don't blame somebody else. Don't blame the preacher. Don't blame. You know what? Listen, guys, I've, I've, I've been born again serving Jesus for many, many years. And, and listen, I've, I've never gone through a hard time and, and, and said, I'm going to blame B for it. Come on. 
I'm having a difficult time. It must be uh, Beatrice's problem. Oh, you know what, man? I've really, this has been a difficult day for me. It must be Pretty Boy Lou's fault. Come on. That's who it's got to be. I'm not going to take personal responsibility for that. Now, now, folks, that sounds ridiculous, but how often do you do that? I'm not going to church anymore. Come on. Why? Well, because somebody offended me, or somebody looked at me crazy, or somebody did such as that. Really, that's all it took? That's all it took. That's all it took? You ought to be standing where I'm standing, everybody looking at you crazy. Come on. So we're going to find ourselves separated because of those type of offenses. And so that leaves a person saying th things like, God doesn't care about me. Come on. Or eventually, well, I really don't even know if I believe in God. Come on. I've got questions. Well, the problem, the reason you've got questions is because you don't go to the answer. <laughs> Folks, i got news for you. Come on, bro. I don't really have any questions anymore. Amen. And any questions I would have are, 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 are so minuscule that they really don't matter. You know, I'm not. You know, maybe I don't have all the answers to biblical uh, trivial pursuit or something, but those really aren't questions. It's trivia. It's trivia. And so I heard. I, heard, uh, I believe it was uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, Brother V and I was talking about different TV preacher. Brother, uh, what the uh, Furtick? What's his first? Yeah, Stephen. Stephen Furtick. Yeah. Heard an interview he was doing. He's like, listen, I got to admit. He said, you know, the the more you read the Bible, he said, the more questions you have. What Bible is he reading? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know what it is. My Bible is the answer sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's not full of questions. It's full of answers. Come on. Amen. And you would think somebody that, quote, unquote, Amen. has an enormous following in church, preaches the word, or whatever he's doing. I don't, I don't follow him, but I did hear that him say that. Folks, Come listen, on. that's just not the, the problem. The more I read the word, man, the more things make sense. Amen. Amen. I, I don't care if it's, you know, oh, I don't know about this. They, they dug up some dinosaur bones. Well, that's... I don't have any questions about that. I need to go to the Ark experience. I don't have. I don't need to go to the Ark experience. You know, I got the Jesus experience right here. Come on. Come on. So, folks, here's the answer. Here is our our source. I, mean, I got all kinds of stuff falling out tonight. Or they'll say things like, "Is God? If God is real or really cares, why don't He just change me to take away my desire to sin?" Come on. Wow. You ever heard that before? Come on. You ever said that before? If, if God loves me so much, well, Pastor Roy's back, at least he's got one honest man in the ground. Man, if God loves me so much or if God's so powerful, why don't he just take it away from me? Well, he did. It was called the cross. Yeah. Amen. Now get crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you can live, but it won't be you that live, but Christ who lives in. And so if you love him so much, why don't you come down from the cross and try to save yourself? Come on. Put yourself in the place of victory rather than putting yourself in the place of defeat. Yes. And so if he wants, because here, here's the thing. I know people that are chain smokers. Come on. That claim to love Jesus. Come on. I'm telling the truth. I know people that are chain smokers. I'm not just picking on people that smoke. I'll just give you that example because it's very obvious. I know people that are chain smokers that plant that say they love Jesus and you sit down and you talk to them and say, man, God, I just can't do it. Mm. But have you ever noticed they seldom light up a cigarette if they go to church? Right. Come on. I remember back in Texas when we art services three or four hours long. Uh, and there's people in our church that smoked. There were, I knew it. Because every single week they bring that same pack of bits and hedges or marble light 100 up there and they stomp them and declare that they have victory and all that stuff. Every single week, another pack. I'm like, man, you know, let's get expensive after a while for you. Just save your money. Pretty soon they start bringing candy cigarettes and acting like they were the real deal. Huh? But they would sit there for three hours. But once they stepped out of the church, they couldn't go three seconds. Come on. They were lighting their next cigarette with the one that was in their mouth. Come on. <laughs> Why? Because they associated being in church with God being able to see those things. Mm -hmm. Come on. Right. Folks, I got news for you. There is nothing hidden from his side. And so if I could just associate me, as Pastor Alex was preaching this past week, about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit, that he sees it all, he does it all. Yes. That the things that you see, that you listen to, I, I don't see anybody when that's that's bound by secular music or they got it in their ear pods or whatever else when they're when they're driving or working or whatever else. I, I don't see them doing that while they're in church. Yeah. Come on, come on, say that. All these up here uh, leading praise and worship. I don't hear them saying, "Well, no, I got to listen to Justin Bieber or whoever the latest person is." <laughs> uh -huh. but hold on, y'all go ahead and worship the Lord, man, because I got something else going on in my head. <laughs> <laughs> because it would be ridiculous, right? Folks, I got news for you. It is ridiculous. Yes. 
Whether it's here or whether it's somewhere else. But the adversary, what he wants to do is he wants to separate you from the reality of who God and where God is. And so you, you've got to separate yourself from those things and put yourself in his prison. So he, in presence. So if he can cut you off from your source, then you become that fruitless, lifeless branch that's described in Matthew chapter 7. It says what? That if a tree does not bear forth good fruit, what's it good for? Nothing. Cut down and cast into the fire. Come on. It's just firewood. It is kindling for the fire. So the adversary, his desire is to make you kindling for fire. The fire. Amen. Okay. So every time you do those things that separate you from him, say to yourself, I am preparing myself. Every time you walk in unforgiveness, you need to say to yourself, I'm preparing myself. Yes. Every time that you're you're you're, you're viewing something, whether it's something uh, sexual immorality or something vulgar on, 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 on a TV screen or a, a smartphone, say to yourself, I'm preparing myself. Mm. But say it with some enthusiasm. Then you can go ahead and f finish that. Or every time you're filling, you're inundating your mind with that secular garbage that's uh, that's causing you to demean women or yourself. Or say to yourself, "Man, I'm, I'm preparing myself. Preparing yourself for what? Man, I'm preparing myself to spend eternity in hell. Come on. Right. Man, I'm pre preparing myself to to for the screams of hell that I'll never escape for, from. Yeah. So every time you do that, say th say that to yourself. Say, "Hey, man, what are you doing?" Well, I'm going to this concert. What for? Man, because I'm preparing myself for a million years from now where the worm never dies. Yeah. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in agony for eternity crying out, why didn't I listen? Man, I could, because I wanted this 15-minute fix for a billion, billion years to Come never on. end. I'm Come preparing on. myself Come for the on. destructive uh, 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 fires of hell that are never going to turn off. Come on. Get, True. Folks, that's reality. And so you try to separate yourself because that's what the enemy, enemy wants. You separate yourself from the reality of the consequence. Yes. That's the reality. So God wants to do what? He wants to bring you into union with him. But the enemy is so good. I'll tell you, well, you don't worry about that. Come on. Just be unfaithful. Come on. Lack commitment. Come on. Do that. Compromise. Come on. That way nobody knows it but Jesus. Be like the church at Laodicea, neither hot or warm, but just neither hot or cold, but lukewarm. Come on. But do it with enthusiasm. I'm preparing myself. Would you prepare yourself for to, to meet Jesus and for him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Oh, no, no, no. Man, I'm preparing myself for him to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Yes. Depart from me, you that, that, that had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. Depart from me. You, 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 you cloud without rain. Come on. I prepared something for you. Yes. It's called the eternity of hell. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. But man, you were so hell bent yeah. on that that I'm going to allow you to separate yourself under that because you didn't want to be separated under me. Wow. Yes. And so he'll do things to cut you off from your source of refreshing, which is the word, which is worship, which is prayer and fellowship with the body of Christ. Yeah. Because if he can separate you from the word, then he can get you focused on temporal desires rather than eternal truths. Come on. That's what he can do. Yeah. Get you out of the word. Why? Because the word will wreck your plans. Woo, come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. It will. It will. It'll wreck your plans. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Because the more you get into to, to the word, the, the less success is important to you. Amen. Uh, Amen. Say that. Hallelujah. I, I'm serious. It, it really is. When I say success, I'm talking about as it's measured in the worldly sense. Yeah. You won't say to yourself, man, I've got I've to make that, that first or second or 20th million. You won't say that. You won't say, man, I've got to somehow gain popularity. Success won't mean a thing in the world to you when you're in the Word. But get out of the Word, it's like, hey, listen. Demas, having loved this present world, has forsaken me, man. He had other plans. He wanted to do things. I, I shared testimony of, of an intern we had one time that was uh, that came when she was very young, and her, her mother wanted her to, to go because she had a, a full ride into a uh, into a college because of some I can't remember the circumstances for it. And so she did. She went, and this was a young lady that God was really doing work in, tremendous things. And every once in a while, it breaks my heart because it'll pop up on them Facebook memories. You know how it does. And I see her witnessing somebody with her, with her Bible open, tears in her eyes. Now she considers herself pansexual. She's shacked up with some old boy. She claims to be an atheist. She's oh, 
pro-abortion, pro-homosexuality, pro-everything. Yes. But you know what? Man, she graduated with honors. Got a good job. Man, she's doing great. She prepared herself. And she violated herself. And Come on. Every bit of morality, but man, man, the world is applauding her. Man, because she stands for every cause that the world stands for. Come on. And Mama's proud. Actually, she's not. Yeah. Wow. Mama called me up two or three years after the fact and said, listen, you were right. I said, I wasn't trying to be right. I was trying to be righteous. Yeah. And I said, the shame is, man, some of those decisions you just can't get back. Can't make it back. He'll get you focused on the temporal rather yes. than the eternal truth. Psalms 107.20, it says, He sent His word and He healed them. Yes. And he delivered them Hallelujah. from their destruction. Hallelujah. He sent his word. Okay. Yes. yes. He sent his word, being Christ. The, 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 yes. the word was evident, obviously, through the through the prophets of old. Yes. That was his word he sent. He sent it through the law. That was his word speaking to people. A separation. Yes. He was giving all those pictures. He he's obviously sent his word when Jesus came. The word came and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Yes. He sent his word through this, this logos, this written word. And he sent his word through that rhema or that, that life-giving word. And he sent his word through that Sophia, that word and that wisdom that's gained over time. All of the all of those things. He sent his word for a purpose to heal them and to deliver them from their destruction. Yes. Folks, listen. Healing and deliverance are not what happens in 10 minutes in a prayer line. Come on. You hear me? Now, I believe in healing. I believe in praying for people and believing God for healing. Amen? You know, Joe Romero, my, my, my brother-in-law, went in and it was it had the COVID. I mean, he had all, he's over 70 years old, diabetic, way overweight, all these problems he's having. And they put him on a ventilator. He's not going to live, prepared. There's just no way. MRSA in his lungs, all of these type of things. But you know what? They forgot that people pray. <laughs> See, that. See, because I don't want him to die. Yeah. Yes. Now, it's not because he's my brother-in-law. It's because he's not saved. Right. Right. Amen. Now, if he was saved, I'd say, man, go be with Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I really would. I mean, listen, there ain't nothing better to do. I mean, you know, go be with Jesus. But he's not born again. Amen. And so I want him born again. Amen. Yes. And so, God, we need you to preserve him. But you know what? He, he's still in. They've got him in a better situation. Now they're saying he's got an 80 or 90% chance of, of full recovery. Hallelujah. Period. So it went from zero to at least he's got 80 or 90%. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And so I'm believing God for that. Now, it hadn't happened overnight. Now, I believe he sent his word to heal us. Yes. And so it's no more to say that God has sent his word to, to heal us and it, or, or to deliver us like 10 minutes in the altar. We've got to get everybody up here crying and maybe they can they can cry a little while and their life is turned around. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like telling somebody that, listen, go join the gym and go one time and, man, you're going to slim down and be in good shape. Come on. Doesn't work, does it? Doesn't work. you got to hit it all the time. Amen. It's got to be consistency. It's got to be something that you stay on top of. And so they are the product of consistency and commitment for those that walk in healing and deliverance. And so it is. It's just like that, that hard work you put in. It's because I'm consistent. It's because I'm committed. You stay in the word. Otherwise, what is it like? It's like that seed that's planted Amen. on the hard ground. Something dries it up or looks by the wayside or something steals it away. So I gotta keep on planting that seed because something's gonna try to steal it away. I gotta keep planting that, that seed because circumstances are coming and trying to dry it up. I gotta keep planting that seed. I gotta keep that word mm -hmm. cultivated in, in the soil of my heart. I gotta keep on, on building those things up because the second I don't, it's gonna dry up or it's gonna be yeah. stolen, it's gonna be taken away from me. And as long as I'm doing that, what happens? Man, I'm healed and I'm delivered and I'm free. Yes, thank you, Lord. I get away from that source. What happens? Man, you begin to wither away. Now, who was the top bodybuilder in the 1970s? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Man, there wasn't, the, nobody said Lou Ferrigno. Nobody said, uh, none of those other guys. What did you say? Everybody said Lou, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I got news for you. Arnold Schwarzenegger is still alive today. But have you seen that guy? Man, I, he, he don't tell me I'll be back. Well, come on back. I'll grab you by that 40 uh, folds of skin drag, draping off your body. I ain't afraid of him. You ain't no Terminator. 
you terminated whatever it was you were doing back then. <laughs> it's kind of funny. We were talking about some movies. They start bringing back all these old guys and putting all these old action heroes. It's kind of embarrassing. It's like, Come on. really? But what happened? Well, in the 70s when he was flexing, he was also injecting himself with Amen. some other things that yes, he was. caused him to blow up, just like they're doing now. Now, back then they didn't talk about it. Now they tell you, listen, if you're going to be that giant, you're, you're putting something else into you. Amen. You stop doing it, what happens? Folks, this is like steroids. Amen. As long as I stay on the juice. Come on, say Come on. Yes. You hear me? As long as I stay on the juice, I am swole. Yeah. You hear me? I am swole as long as I'm on the juice. Get off the juice, amen? You're no longer swole. You become a shadow of your former self. So he wants to separate you from the word. He also wants to separate you from your worship. If he separates you from worship, then Satan can get you focused on selfishness rather than self-denial. Psalms 22.3 says that God does what? Inhabits the praises of his people. Yes. This is amazing. That habitation is the word yasha, and it means to be to enthroned on, to dwell, or to marry. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That he, mar he marries us through our praise. Amen. And so it's also, you see it in 2 Corinthians 11.2, it says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you, I've married you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And so marriage throughout the scriptures always used as a type and shadow of self-sacrifice and submission. Yeah. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church yeah. and gave himself for it. So marriage is always a thing not of self-indulgence, right. but Come of self-sacrifice. Yeah. I've heard young people say, man, I can't wait till I get married. Well, why do you want to get married? Ah, uh, you know. <laughs> what do you mean I know? I've been married 34 years. What do you mean I know? Well, you know, you know. Oh, that's why you're getting married. Well, dude, you don't want a wife then, but you want some flusy. Come on. Amen. That's what. That's what they want. Come on. Oh, because then, man, I'm hooked up every day. Whatever else. Really, you think that's what marriage is all about? Come on. No, marriage is about laying your life down. Yes. It's giving up yourself for somebody else, yes. loving someone yes. else. And so if you think it's all about some type of ongoing sexual encounter, i got news for you. <laughs> if that's what you, all you think it is, then you're not getting married. Come on. You just got yourself some little honey on the side. Right. So it's always that type of self-sacrifice and submission. Yes. He says, listen, he inhabits his praises. That is submitting yourself unto God. So if the enemy can disconnect you from that truth, then what he's done, he's defeated you before you could ever answer the veil to step into the ring. He's got you. Thank you, Lord. If you think that your worship is simply about what it can do for you, then you're not doing anything for him. What does James 4, 7 say? Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist. Then what? Then you can resist. Yeah. Without submission... Without worship, that's what worship is. I'm submitting myself unto him. There is no resistance. Come on. So your warfare is always going to be tied into your worship. Yes. Show me somebody that's a reluctant so uh, worshiper. Yeah. I'm going to show you somebody that's a non-existent warrior. That's Come on. So true. Period. That's so true. You give me a you give me a hardcore worshiper. I'm going to show you somebody that is a hardcore warrior for Christ Jesus. Thank you. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 16, says. Thou will show me the path of life. Yes. Thou shall show me the path of life. Um, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Yes. And a light to my path. If he wants to show me the path of life, he's going to show it to me through the word. Yes. Because he says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Right? At your right hand, Psalm 48, 10 says, thy right hand is full of righteousness. Yes. There are pleasures ever more for eternity there's that eternal thing that we're looking for god loved the world so much and gave his son that, will, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have what everlasting i'm going to have the type of life that adam had before he fell that's what it is and so uh nehemiah 8 10 says the joy of the lord is your strength isn't it funny that you, you know if i said hey uh randria do you know the joy of the lord is our strength 
Yes. Hallelujah. And you'd say, Amen. And I'd say, Well, how do you know that? Because when I dwell in the Lord, I know it's everything. Is that the truth? Is that the word? Yes. Yes. But what if I said, Hey, you believe that's true because it's in the word, right? Yeah. What if I said, Where is that in the word? Come on. I honestly say I don't know. Where would you have guessed? The Psalms probably? probably? Psalms, yeah. <laughs> Everybody probably would have, right? Yes. Isn't it funny that it wasn't in the Psalms? Then it was in Nehemiah 8:10. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now we're talking, we're not talking about a people that were, 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 were the conquerors. We're not talking about people that had it all going on. Yeah. This wasn't them marching into Jerusalem with the no. with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. No. This was those that, that had a, a, a sword in one hand and a, and, a, and, a, and a hammer or whatever the tool was that'd be the sign in the other hand. This was a people under great duress. Yeah. Hallelujah. They had just been, uh, been uh, they'd been coming out of uh, exile and Babylonian captivity. They're rebuilding this wall. Would it take them 50, what, 52 days? I think it was. So, I mean, these were people that were in a very intense time about all of the people surrounding them were opposing yes. them yes. and everything else. Yeah. And he pipes in. <laughs> Come on now. now, if he's sitting somewhere singing to King Saul with a harp in his hand, <laughs> oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength, or eating grapes, or all the, whatever it was. Man, I can imagine it. Right. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, I can tell. Uh -huh. Oh, joy. But we're talking about people that yes. were under duress. Yeah. And they said the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. And so worship isn't so you can party. Worship is so you can persevere. Yeah. You hear me? That's what it's for. Yeah. It's so you can persevere through times of trial yeah. and times of, 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 of opposition. Yeah. So just like the army of the Philistines, they set up camp in a place designed to be given to give them strategic advantage by cutting off Israel. Yes. The adversary does the same thing to cut you off from your source of the anointing. That's what he's going to do. He's going to try to cut you off from that source so you'll dry up. Now, fast forward. They set up at the place of the branch. Yes. They set up at the place of the well. They set up at the edge of the blood. And look at verse 2. Somebody read that verse 2 to me out loud. 1 Samuel 17, verse 2. What's it say? Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Eli. Elah? Elah. Elah. So Saul countered by gathering his, uh, his troops near the valley of Elah. And so... Basically what that means is the adversary, his, his plan, his strategy was to cut them off from their source. Okay? So the adversary wants to cut you off from your source. How are you going to counter that? How are you going to counter that? See, every time we're faced with opposition, we've got to think of ourselves in a way to counter that. Okay? Period. I don't care where you're at. Wherever you, wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you've got to be aware. You know, we minister at a place that has the potential to turn deadly. Amen. Potential to turn deadly. I'll, I'll just admit it. Listen, oh, don't say that too out loud. Man, you got people, young people here. I'm just telling you, listen. Your school, the post office. Amen. Walmart, those places have the potential to turn out deadly. Yes, they do. They really do. I just want to take the fight to the enemy. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to say it's got the potential to turn out deadly to the devil. Amen? Right, yes. right. Because I'm not the intimidated. I'm the intimidator. Yes. Period. True. But we go into a place like that. But you know what I do? I don't go in with my head down. Period. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, maybe they're going to get it one day. When you're witnessing, when you're preaching, don't put a hoodie on. Come on. You want to say that? You know what a hoodie does? It creates blind spots. Yes, it does. If you, if you need to wear a hat, wear a hat. It covers up your ears. Don't put a hoodie on because you can't see what's coming from your left and to your right. Come on. I've been telling people that for years. Some people listen to me. Some people don't. They put their hoodie on. They look like some elf out there trying to witness to people. <laughs> and so it does. It creates, in the natural, it creates blind spots. Spiritually, what it does, it shuts you off from people and you look unaccessible. Amen. It's kind of like witnessing to people in the daytime. If take your sunglasses off. They need to be able to see your eyes. They need to yes. see that you're a real person, that you're just Come not somebody on. out there spitting out work. So there's certain practical things that you're doing that really translate into the spiritual as well. And so you get into a place like there's something that you're going to counter. So when I walk into an environment like that, I'm looking around. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
I'm looking for threats. I'm looking for situations. Come on. I'm measuring all these type of things. And I'm thinking in my head, okay, yeah, I've seen that. I've only seen, I've only been out there a million times, obviously. And so I know tendencies. I know certain things that are developing. Yes. I watch people the whole time. I'm looking around. And so I'm not oblivious. If I'm witnessing, you know, or if I'm not witnessing, I always position myself so I can get the greatest vantage point. Why? Because I'm not just out there to take care of me, but I'm out there to take care of you. Amen. And so if I see something developing, I'm going to position myself to counter what's developing. Come on. Period. And so I'm going to get somewhere where I can end the situation as quick as possible yes. with the least amount of, of opposition. Amen. Uh, a few years ago, there, uh, not too many years ago, that there was a there was a guy out there that was giving us a problem to a couple of our teams. Clarissa was one of them, and I think Judah was. And so, kind of a big kid, you know, man, I'm I'm not a kid anymore. So I I don't I don't need to get into altercations that are going to get me punched in the mouth. I don't want to get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and so I was watching the situation. I sized him up. I put myself in a situation, and as soon as it went down. I ended it just like that. I took him to the ground. I immobilized him, and he wasn't going anywhere. Period. He, he didn't know what got him. He just knew something got him that he wasn't getting loose of. Amen. And he went from this, this person that was the aggressor doing vile and saying vile things, tell, looking at me saying, are, are you going to kill me? That's what he said. He said at least three times. I said, no, I'm not planning on killing you. But if you resist me, you're going to take a nap. <laughs> you're going to go nighty night, and the police will be waking you up in a minute because I'm going to put you to sleep. Well, I countered. I put myself in a situation to be able to do that. Yes. Well, one of the guys on the team said, oh, man, I didn't know we could do that. I said, we can't. I can't. Come on. Because you try to do it, you'll roll up. Oh! And you're subject to get yourself punched in the mouth and four or five other people punched in the mouth in the whole process. Amen. I'm being strategic. Amen. Well, strategically, you don't want it to ever come to that. Amen. So you prepare people in advance not to overreact. Yes. Not to not to get frustrated. Come on. But just to pretty much have a poker face. And what you notice, people picked up on it. You say what you want to. Still just standing there. I'm gonna do some. Oh, I don't think you really are. You just keep conversation. Keep everything. You don't escalate things unnecessarily. Amen. You counter that. Now, how does Saul? counter this opposition from the Philistines. This is where you've got to pay some close attention to what I'm about to show you tonight. Don't miss this, because it's going to show you the error that I believe is continually made by so, so many believers. Check, check this out, what it says. The adversary always goes after the source, right? Where he cuts off your supply line because he desires to starve you out. Or to lay siege. You look at so many times throughout the script, they laid siege upon the city. In other words, they cut off the water source into the city. They didn't allow any supplies. And what ended up happening? Man, people were eating their own children. I mean, that's how wicked it got. So let me put you in a situation that will force you to make decisions and make sacrifices you otherwise wouldn't make. That you're going to turn animalistic. And so he is willing to wake you out because his intelligence gathering has indicated that most professing believers are just simply too impatient and they lack perseverance. So what are you going to do? Because if your answer don't come immediately, or three Sundays from now, he knows you're going to give up. Come on. So all he has to do is just keep the answer at bay. Now think about the book of Daniel. He said, I prayed all these days. And what did he say? The prince of Persia has withstood me, but God sent the angel. Well, what did he do? During the time of wisdom, he just kept praying. And so your answer may not come immediately, but it'll come. Amen. Folks, I, I remember and I've shared testimony about even the training center. Well, the, the Lord spoke to us 25 years ago about the training center. Now, what if we'd have gave up because it didn't happen? Come on. Well, we wouldn't be having this conversation about it right now. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We had people around. It'll never work. Yeah. That became kind of an inside joke for us. It'll never work. Yeah. Well, no, it'll never work for you. Amen. Because you're impatient. Oh, uh, it'll never work. No, it'll never work for you. Because you're not willing to endure. It'll never work for you because you won't make the sacrifices. Come on. But folks, for everyone that said it'll never work, you know what happened? It didn't work for them because most of them have abandoned the work of the ministry and they didn't survive the anointing. Amen. I can could, I could show you that I'm not saying they're going to hell. I'm not saying they're wicked people. I'm just saying, man, 
They just really don't have anything to offer anymore. Not impressed with their lack of patience and endurance being to be or lack of perseverance. So Saul, like that underbelieving church, plays right at the hands, and he counters by gathering his, his troops at the Valley of Elah. Here's what you don't want to miss. Elah literally means the terebinth. So I expected you Bible scholars to go, wow. I really didn't. I didn't expect anybody to get it. What's significant about that? Where he gathered them? Glad you asked. Huh? What is it? I'm about to tell you. Glad you asked. Second Samuel chapter 18. Do you remember the first verse of chapter 16 in 1 Samuel? How long will you mourn Saul? Seeing I rejected him, right? Who was Saul? First king. Which meant at one point he was anointed. He was anointed to be king, right? Yes. Second Samuel 18, what we see is we see Absalom, who was, what? Who was he? David's son. He was staging a coup in order to take over the kingdom from his father, David, who had intended to give it to Solomon, right? right. Now let's look at verses 6 through 10. So David's army marched to the field to engage Israel in battle, which took place in the forest of Ephraim. There the people of Israel were defeated by David's servants, and the slaughter was great that day, 20,000 men. Mm -hmm. The battle spread over the whole countryside, and that day the forest devoured more people than the sword. The yes. forest devoured more people than the sword. Wow. Now Absalom was riding on his mule when he met the servants of David. David, as the mule went under the thick branches of the large terebinth, Absalom's head was caught in the tree. His hair was caught in the tree, and the mule under him kept going. And he was suspended in midair. When one of the men saw this, he told Joab, I saw Absalom hanging in the terebinth tree. Wow. So Saul would literally prove to be a prophetic type of being undone by rebellion, constituting a false anointing. And so Saul camped them by what would represent a false anointing that's going to catch up to you. That's going to cut you off. So the terebinth was a type of that coming to an end. Being cut off from your attempt of rebellion and a coup. And so they set up on the other side, away from the branch, in the distance from the well, and nowhere near the blood. Whereas Saul set up by the place that's designed to reveal that you don't have any anointing on you any longer. Yeah. See, that's what happened to Absalom. He had the characteristics, but he didn't have the character. And his characteristics are what got him caught in the terebinth tree. So Saul had the pride. Saul had the look. He had all those things. And he camped out by the place that would later reveal the same characteristics in David's own son, Absalom. Yes. And so where you are established or where you set up matters. Wow. Do you hear me? Where you are established or where you're set up matters because if you're out of position, it will often mean that you're out of promise. Come on. Amen. Get out of position, get out of promise. I've seen so many people over the years that, man, maybe God had gifted them in a certain, yeah. a, a certain place, a certain uh, giftedness in their life, but it wasn't enough for them. Yeah. They didn't just want what they had. They wanted what you had. Now, I know God's called me to do this, but man, that don't get as much attention as, as what they get. Right. And so I want their attention. So they get out of position, they get out of promise, and what happens? They get caught in the terebinth. Yeah. Because they cut themselves off from the source, and they've been looking to this place that may keep them elevated. Mm -hmm. You hear me? That's what the terebinth did. It elevated uh, Absalom, yeah. but to his own demise. Right. Yes. So you can elevate yourself through pride. Isn't that what the, the, the lie that the serpent gave Eve? Yes. Listen, yes. here's what you're going to do. You're going to elevate yourself. Yeah. Rather than saying, God, listen, Jesus gave the promise. If he's lifted up, he'll draw them into him. So he's going to be lifted up on the cross, not yes. the false cross, which is the type of another tree, which is a terebinth. Mm -hmm. So, folks, we need to come to that place where whatever it costs us, whatever it is to position ourselves, to put us in a place where it is. And so we see that. We see that in Jonah. Now, Jonah, the prophet, you know, we see him quoted, you know, just like uh, it's quoted by Jonah the prophet. He was out of position when he went to Tarsus, right? Yes. 
found a great fish prepared for him and, and came to the place where he ended up getting spit out on dry land and he went to his right position, which was Nineveh. Marched across Nineveh. Nineveh repented from their sins. He could have said to himself, listen, that Tarsus is fertile soil. Now I've heard people say all the time, oh, you don't need to go do that. You can do that right where you're at. Amen. Well, if God told you to do where you're at, you can. Yes. But if God didn't tell you that, no, you can't. Yep. Come on. I don't care where it's at. If God didn't tell you to do it there, it ain't going to happen because you're out of position. You're going to be out of promise. Now, I've seen people of the ministry that uh, over the years that have been involved in our churches and our ministries. They said, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave and I'm going to go through such and such. I'm like, well, what are you going to do? And they say, well, I'm going to do this. I'm like, there ain't no way it's going to happen. What do you mean it ain't going to happen? I said, listen, I don't, I'm not rooting against you. I'm rooting for you. I'm just telling you it's not going to happen. Yes. Well, why isn't it going to happen? Well, because you're thinking of yourself more highly than you should at this point. Come on. That's so true. Because what you think is because you're a part of a bigger picture and you're getting attention that you're responsible for that bigger picture. But well, you're really not. What you are is you're just getting to reap where you have not sown. Disconnect yourself from position, you disconnect yourself from promise. Amen. I've seen it over the years. I've seen people that, man, just had an enormous, maybe they had a gift of encouragement. That was their gifted. Man, I tell you what, if you wanted somebody to encourage you to pray for you, that was the person to do it. <coughs> they thought, I need to be more than an encourager. Yes. I need to be the lead man. I need to be such and such. I need to get the attention. So they did. They said, listen, I'm going to translate that into it. Then what ended up happening? Well, they're no longer encouraged or an encourager because out of position, out of promise. Folks, I've seen it so many times. And so where you position yourself matters, period. I'm not talking about the comfortable place. I'm talking about the place that, that, that's a commitment place where God wants you to be. Yes. And so not a lot of times. Listen, I tell you what. The, my most comfortable place is, was, was not when I crossed that Decatur Street in, in, in February of 1996. Un, very uncomfortable. You know what I thought to myself? Man, I can do it. Man, I'm in the wrong place. Well, about that time, the Holy Spirit rebuked me and said, no, you're in right where I told you to be. Amen. Well, God, man, I feel undone. Well, good. Now I can do the work. Wow. Amen. He said, I needed you to feel undone because you were too full of you, so I needed to get you to put into put, put into a position where you had to depend upon me. Yes. yes. Okay, God, I get it. All right, I'll put myself in uncomfortable situations. I'll do things that, that just naturally I don't desire. Folks, many times you'll do that. Well, I want this and that. I want well, go do it. But just remember, you're preparing yourself. Wow. Amen. Now you're either going to prepare yourself for something good, or you're going to prepare yourself for judgment. But you're preparing yourself. Amen. So the Philistines and Israel's Israelites faced each other on opposite hills, with a valley between them. And I'll stop right there tonight. Hey, Amen. That went way too quick. That's enough. Yeah. Time. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are preparing us, Lord God. Preparing a place for a people, Lord God. And we thank you that where you are, we can be also, Lord God. Father, we thank you that part of that preparation, Lord God, is not some mansion on a hilltop in glory, Lord God. Yes. But Father, you said we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're a place that you've prepared to dwell in us so that we can dwell in you. So, Father, we want to be in that position. We want to be rooted in to the branch, Lord God, grafted in. Father, we want to be constantly in supply of the well, Lord God, because we rely upon the blood of Jesus. Amen. And we thank you for these things in his precious name. Amen. 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 And amen. Hallelujah.